Welcome to the 33rd Parallel, a video series about science, technology, and the politics that control it. For a long time now, scientists have been busy congratulating each other for proving some aspect of the theory of relativity. As recently as 1995, they've rewarded their colleagues with Nobel Prizes and declared long-held beliefs about the theory as proven fact. Meanwhile, we, as part of the unwashed masses, wait patiently for our eminent scientists to let us in on the joke. Aside from the atomic bomb, just what part of this illustrious concept can we hold in our hands and use in our daily lives? One is left wondering if scientists even care about the day-to-day -day phenomena that are still left unexplained. We may ask, what is gravity? And the answer is gravitons. Or, what is electricity? Well, it's electrons. Aside from their precious relativity, are there coexistent theories that are worth considering? After all, the majority of our greatest scientists Michael Faraday, James Clerk Maxwell, Sir William Crookes, and Lord Kelvin never even heard of relativity, nor would it have helped them if they did. Just what made scientists want to embrace the peculiar claims of a second-rate clerk in a Swiss patent office as the preeminent end-all to scientific progress? As almost an apology to the unworkability of Einstein's rants, we are offered a steady stream of new and ever more complex quantum mechanics and string theory to dazzle us or baffle us beyond belief. If Michael Faraday and Sir William Crookes never used relativity to further their understanding of gravity and electrodynamics, just what did they base their experiments on? And why do we never re-examine those concepts? Is there a forgotten physics with a different set of rules, hidden away from us early in the last century by a powerful elite who fear that the technology based on it will strip away their power and wealth and liberate us from their grip? A bold and outrageous statement that can never be proven, right? Wrong. William R. Lyon is our guest tonight. He's the author of three books. Pentagon Aliens, formerly Space Aliens from the Pentagon, now in its third printing, Occult Ether Physics, and The Free Energy Surprise. Mr. Lyon was born in Big Spring, Texas, and raised in the boom towns of the great West Texas Wildcatters. He had the opportunity of being educated about fuel and its impact on industry firsthand. From there, he pursued an interest in aviation in Army Air Force, where he earned a position in Air Force Intelligence. He has acquired a BS degree with a double major in Art and Industrial Technology from Sam Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas in 1969. He also has the distinction of living in New Mexico for the past 25 years, during a time and place where knowledge of saucer technology necessarily meant knowing individuals who worked on top secret projects at Los Alamos and Alamogordo, where individuals such as Werner von Braun and his Nazi collaborators were well known to the community at large, where, much like those individuals who had the misfortune of living in or near Mena, Arkansas, never got the chance to tell the rest of the world what was really going on. Well, today, Mr. Lyon will do just that. Mr. Lyon, welcome to the 33rd Parallel. Okay, I'd like to uh, get into some uh, free energy technology <clears throat> now. Um, the first thing I'm really fascinated about is... Uh, your uh, discussion of the atomic hydrogen torch. Uh, and if, if anybody's a welder these days, they probably haven't even heard of an atomic hydrogen torch. Uh, maybe you might want to explain a little bit about that and why it's so special. Interesting thing is, since I came out with this material just this year, in, in the immediate future, General Electric is now issuing a new version of an atomic hydrogen torch. Isn't that How about that? And How did that happen? A, a person phoned me the other day and told me all about it. And uh, they have a new atomic hydrogen torch they're, they're, they're preparing to release for the public. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Isn't that a coincidence that it was dead for all those years yeah. and now I published something on it and now they're coming out with it? Now, I wonder how they're going to uh, explain the, the uh, inordinate amount of energy. Uh, you might want to uh, maybe uh, talk about why this is so special, this torch. Well, of course, the discovery of the atomic hydrogen, what I call the atomic hydrogen process, was supposedly made by Langmuir about 1909 or 1912. And uh, he was a chemist who had a lot of... Uh, discoveries in the area of uh, electrolysis and, and so forth. And uh, he uh, 
claimed, and of course the thing about Langmuir is he was an early relativist. So right. he believed in the relativistic, what I call RQ, RQMs, relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, they, uh, he basically, you know, believed in the idea that however much energy was produced when you, when the hydrogen recombined, was the amount of energy it took to separate the hydrogen molecules into diatomic, uh, from diatomic molecules into monoatomic hydrogen. So basically, this process involves the separation of hydrogen, which tends to come as uh, as uh, diatomic molecules, two two atoms together, uh, into its separate atoms. And then when those atoms come back together, they release 109 kilocalories per mole. It sounds like a lot. The molecules, uh, you know, per uh, the mole, and so that is a lot of energy. Now, what I found was a, a well-known Encyclopedia of Science, which says that it takes 103 calories per gram mole to separate the hydrogen, although the relativistic quantum mechanics say that it takes the same amount of heat to separate the molecules as you get back when they recombine. So you're getting nothing in you're, You end reaction. up getting it all, that you're just using electrical energy to separate it, and then you get it back when it combines. Well, why even do it? I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, right. If you could just right. do it with electricity, except you get temperatures that are far above what you would get with an electric arc. In fact, you discovered a, an old uh, text on, on uh, this reaction, and even a photograph of uh, an atomic hydrogen torch. Uh, hydrogen being set free in a chemical reaction is often more reactive than hydrogen gas. The activity of such nascent, nascent newborn hydrogen in the act of liberation from its compounds is due to the hydrogen being in the atomic state. Uh, and down here, hydrogen molecules disassociate to atoms endothermically at high temperatures. Heat of dissociation, about 103 cal calories gram mole, an electric arc, or, uh, or by irradiation. The hydrogen atoms recombine at the metal surface to provide heat for the acquired welding. Now, I've been assured that this has to be a typographical error on the on the part of the Van Nostrand Encyclopedia people, even though this particular paragraph comes out of what is something like the fifth edition. Now, is you that know, right? They just, they're so five editions of mistakes. Yeah, five editions. They have just carried this. Nobody's caught it, you know. And the thing is, is this company published books on Tesla at one time when Tesla was alive. Oh, is that right? Yes, same company. Well, that's interesting that they would uh, claim that, uh, you know, they've made mistakes in five editions. Here we have this thing. This is circa 1933. Uh, it's a welding book, welding and its applications. And it has here atomic hydrogen arc welding. In general, it says here, molecular hydrogen or hydrogen in its normal state as distinguished from atomic hydrogen is a diatomic gas. That is, each molecule consists of two atoms. When hydrogen, when hydrogen is broken down into the atomic form, it is very active and has great tendency to recombine to form molecular hydrogen. This is exactly what happens in the atomic hydrogen process. When the molecular hydrogen passes through the arc, much of it is changed into the atomic state and thus absorbs considerable amount of energy. In escaping the arc stream, these atoms recombine into molecules again at the outer edge of the arc fan, and the extra energy is released as heat. This extra heat is added to the intense heat of the arc itself, produces a temperature that is somewhat higher than either the ordinary arc or the gas flame. Theoretical temperature of the atomic hydrogen flame has been found to be 7,254 degrees Fahrenheit. However, heat absorption due to the formation of atomic hydrogen, uh, well, it says here, reduces this to 5,340 degrees. But it talks about the uh, what you're talking about as mm -hmm. far as recombining. Yeah. 